So we're, we're recording now. So welcome everyone. We've just uh, kicked off to what we're doing with our unit two of course, which is, uh, here's the schedule that you all can see. Today we're looking at the book of Joshua. Now, you'll get a copy of these slides later. So use and remember these ones because it's got the dates for the courses. So we're meeting next Sunday, so remember that. And then we've got a bit of a break for the uh, school holidays. Then we're back into it effectively all the way through to uh, early September. Of course, we miss uh, Father's Day. We said all that one. But as we're doing, we're starting the book of Joshua. And I know a couple of you got some uh, Bibles there, which is really handy. Thank you very much. And as we'll look at quite a few of those uh, passages as we go through today. Uh, now, you may remember from last week in terms of the big picture overview that uh, Dave gave. Dave gave. Yes. Yes, Dave gave. All right. So, a couple of the key things about this whole book, and it's been a, a book of conjecture in terms of, well, who actually wrote it and when they actually wrote it. But in the end, I'm not sure if that's a, uh, it's not a showstopper from my perspective. But I think many people have got PhDs in uh, coming up with a whole stack of alternative views and whatever. We'll have a look at a couple of those, but we want to just get a sense of today. Big picture of Joshua, uh, not just the person, but actually what's this book saying to us? So it'd be a great opportunity for us to delve in. And for those of you who remember from the sermon series we've been having, and that'll come in more play for next week when we're doing Judges, because we did Judges earlier this year, but we did Joshua. How long ago was that, day? Joshua would have been, is that last year or the year before? Yeah. So... So it's interesting. So we'll just see how that remembers in each of our uh, in each of our minds. But as we remember from the first unit, Joshua is noted as the author of this particular book. And there's a couple of key things we want to think through in terms of that. I mean, Joshua makes a lot of references to it. But the thing we need to remember is, and I think this is the most important takeout for that whole thing. Joshua is like Moses was a covenant mediator. That's pretty important in terms of where we are in the history of the people of Israel. In terms of he mediated, and you can see that as you've probably flipped through, uh, scanning through Joshua, in terms of how often that he was speaking, God had told him what to say, he passed that on. And he was mediating for the people of Israel. <coughs> and the other key thing is he wrote quite a lot of this stuff that we see in the book of Joshua. So there's two particular verses there. Get a volunteer. You guys already got your Bibles open. Don, can you do the first one, the Joshua one? And Glenn, can you do the uh, Deuteronomy? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Those two verses, 25 to 26. You want to read them out nice and loud, please, please. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, 25 to 26. All right. On that day, Joshua made a covenant with the people. And there at Shurkham, he reaffirmed to them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it upon them under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. Okay. Come back to that. Thanks, Ms. Long. And Joshua 31, 9 11. Deuteronomy 31. Sorry, Deuteronomy 31. That's what I asked. Yeah. <laughs> so Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant, the Lord, and to all the other elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, in the year of counseling debts during the festival of tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God, the place he will choose, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. Okay. So there's a couple of things they're mentioning in terms of what it is for the God's law, in terms of some sort of remembrance focus, but also what Joshua did himself, as it says in that uh, couple of verses there at the end of Joshua, how Joshua wrote these things down and added them to the book of the law of God. We see that that reminder every seven years they were to read it. So what Joshua had written 
had also become part of that enduring passage of information. And I think what's, what's uh, important, and uh, a couple of you are probably more uh, ancient history scholars than I, but a lot of the cultures in those days, the culture was of oral history, not written history. I think it just strengthens the value that we have God's word. God really is the author. Does that mean that they remember things better? Sorry, what did you say? Does that mean they remember things better? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, at least, at least just to say, less inaccuracy or changes, like as in some political circles that we've seen in the last number of decades and years. Anyway, as, we, as we're moving on, though. so we see that Joshua had a significant role in actually what is the book of Joshua. Now, a couple of things about uh, as we go through Joshua. We'll think through, there's two key aspects about this whole book. Now, but first off, we think one of the key matters that we see in the book of Joshua, this is a description of all Israel. It is a unified group of people. I know they had their tribal aspects, but at this point of time, they were seen as the people of Israel. The people of God. I think it's so important to remember that. Because we, as we see through the judges and the end of Joshua's life, then into judges, there was a lot more of this tribe did this, this tribe did that, that tribe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But here, it's all of Israel, because they've been through a lot, as you can imagine. And the book, in particular, has two main two main sections. The first section, which is the first twelve chapters, it looks at the conquest of the land. And it's broken into three phases. Being an electrical engineer, I guess that's handy to remember the three phases. The central part, the southern part, and then the northern part. And then the last uh, bunch of chapters, 13 to 24, is about the land allocation. So we see a lot happening in these particular passages. One of the, uh, one of the key things we want to think through as we go and try to get some understanding of this whole passage, is that this is seen as a holy word. It is God's word, Yahweh's word. It's not Joshua's word. It wasn't Moses' word. This is God's word. God had actually commanded the people to move in and take possession of that land. And we think through that in terms of remembering, of course, the promises that have been made back to Abraham. And God had shown him, this is, this is your land, you'll be for your descendants after you. And a key promise being made, of course, to Abraham about that land. Now, as an aside, it's interesting as we read through this and remember through our sermon series, of course, um, the occupation really didn't get completed till David's right. And for those of you who remembered our sermon series earlier this year with Judges, uh, never really got to that point where yeah, all Israel was completely settled, we're happy, let's move in, have milk and honey and stuff like that. Yeah, so it was trouble from there on. So I think that's part of God's narrative. But what I think importantly it shows, and this is one of the key takeouts from today, it's not about the people because this is God's war, it's about, it's about God's faithfulness for his people. Despite their sinfulness, despite their rebellion, God still provided for them. What's that word that comes to mind? Five letters, start with G. Um, Tony? Grace. Grace. Yeah. This really is a wonderful outworking of God's grace. Now, as we, as we know with the moving into the land, there was some specific areas. Now, later on, we'll show a map so you get a sense of that. Um, but in terms of how they settled in and live in that particular part of the world. I, I, know, um, I know one or two of you in some other courses have travelled there. Who were, like I know when Roy was here, when we did the New Testament one subject, he had a lot of photos from when he had travelled through that section up near Galilee in Jerusalem. It's really handy, we saw some of those pictures. Has anyone actually travelled in some of these parts of 
Israel. Uh, no. Double bucket list. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, my bucket's got really small now. Makes it easier to achieve the list. I have to talk to Roy because I know he's got some photos, some historical things that might help us get some physical sense of that. The other things about the, uh, the conquest, though, the nature of this conquest, as I said before, the difficulties they experienced, and we'll pick this up a little bit more in next week's Unit 2 Judges, but it was attributed more because of their disobedience. So again, I want to keep holding on to God was faithful. They have not been faithful in the end. And you, you can't help but ask that question. You wonder if, if, if they had been faithful from the first day, if they had been faithful on the second day and the third day, would they have had those problems? I think intuitively we probably know <laughs> the answer to that. But I think it's quite interesting. And just be interesting to get a passage. Lewis, you want to look that up for us? The Judges 2, verses 20 to 23. If you could read that out for us, please. That's it. <clears throat> Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, because this nation has violated the covenant I ordained for their ancestors and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. The Lord had allowed those nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Lewis. So it's interesting that when Joshua died, then straight into the judges, how God has been using them as these other nations to keep testing the people to remain faithful. So it's not a test of God's unfaithfulness. God remains faithful to his promises. And those of you who have done some of those other subjects, you might remember that uh, promise to fulfillment subject. It's all about God's keeping his promises throughout history. And we'll look a little bit of that, uh, remind ourselves of that next week. So there's a couple of things. But as we think through this, as I said before, some people have tried to well, reconstruct what they thought could really have happened. There's been a couple of uh, postulations about what that could be. Um, I won't give my view of them yet. We'll talk about them. But there was this infiltration model. Now, the infiltration model was where the separate desert tribes in that part of the world, and they slowly infiltrated into what was what we call Canaan. And these bunch of people were just part of that. So the Israelites moving up the you know, It's amazing how some people get these ideas from me. Anyway. Um, and but only a small number of people had been actually down in Egypt. Now, to me, that's very blinkered because have they not read Genesis? <laughs> um, and then the beginning of Exodus, have they not read that either? Anyway, I'm just letting you know, these are some models that people have put forward saying, oh, this is what really did occur. The story in Joshua, it's like people trying to come up with a view of how God created the world. Well, he didn't do it like that. He couldn't have. Science doesn't agree with that. Well, actually... Genesis 1 is not a science account. It's actually a written account. And Don, you probably know more about this in terms of the prose style that that Hebrew was actually written in. So people trying to make things where, well, I find it pretty hard to get that argument that it's valid. Then there was another model they talked about, this uh, peasant revolt. You know, you always hear the, uh, the emperors in some place, oh, those peasants are revolting. Yes. Well, hold on now. What, what peasants? Well, they are looking to this other group of people called the uh, Hamaru people, who were like the, the outcast, the, the lowest caste of people. And these other ones had joined in, these people from wherever they were. You know, they were in Egypt, but most people didn't know that they travelled around and 
come around the side and all that sort of stuff. But they have joined in there and become such a mass of peasants. But uh, the kings in those little despot areas got worried and started fighting and whatever. But just the volume of all these peasants was too big. Now, I struggle with those sort of things. That's what I put out this last one here. Well, I think the real best test to actually show the validity of what the book of Joshua is. I always go back to say, what did Jesus say about the Old Testament? And if you remember from our New Testament one subject, that was actually a key point we were thinking of. So, um, Andrew, do you want to read Luke 24, 27 for us and then flip over to 44, 47? There's probably a lot more, but there are two ones. Yeah. Is it about taking God out of the equation? Is that what the, uh, the essence of those two models are? A lot of those alternative views probably have as a basis of that. Yeah. I mean, it's more of a, I think it's more of a, there's a different ways to happen. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the the God references don't really come into yeah. it. Yeah. I think that, I mean, a lot of the time these are critical scholars operating in an entirely different paradigm. Yeah. They're reading the text as an artifact in itself, which hmm. is an artifact against, sometimes we've sometimes against other artifacts. And they're not privileging the text, yeah. um, which often they will accuse of, I guess, confessing scholars of privileging the text. Yeah. Um, but often it's also they underprivilege the text, I think, in that they, they, they don't treat it enough as an artifact mm -hmm. um, and they treat it as a biased account or something, uh, forgetting that everything has a bias to it and you just need to account for where it fits in. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it depends on, I guess, I don't know, they might not be trying to, try to keep God out, but they might not just... It just doesn't have him in the equation at all. It's just... And it's not, I mean, you see that with us through a lot of the you know, dissertations that are made about uh, some of the books of the Bible. Uh, it's not, unfortunately, it's not inconsistent with a lot of the way the world thinks. Uh, Andrew. All right. So, um, tw uh, 27 verse. And the beginning, so and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And jumping over to 44, he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Thank you. <clears throat> yep. So that's where Jesus is walking on the road with those two guys to amaze. He tells them all of it. And we don't talk about it now, that New Testament one subject. Wouldn't it have been great to be a fly on the back <laughs> as they walk along to listen to what he was saying? Absolutely incredible. But part of that God's law, the history, would have included what we're studying through here. And, of course, we know about the Messiah, who would suffer. Where, that, where does that get first mentioned in Scripture? Genesis. Yeah, it gets mentioned right back at the beginning of Genesis. Right. The seed, the promised seed, ultimately defeat Satan's kingdom, kingdom of death, to bring us into life with God forever. Mm. So it would have been great just to be able to listen to what Jesus has been saying. But we do have all these things in Scripture <coughs> so that we can be taught. And, and uh, Timothy reminds us, of course, that all Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching training, correcting, et cetera, et cetera. So what was that about Timothy 1? That uh, 1 Timothy 3, 16, 17. What about it? Well, in terms of, in terms of all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching and training, et cetera. 
Okay. Good verse today. Right, as we uh, as we keep moving, from my perspective, as well as what the uh, notes will do, and you'll do that when you read through the notes a bit more. Um, the biblical account is is clear though. One thing we learned about Joshua was he was a great leader. He followed through with what Moses had done, and certainly a great military strategist. And most important, the role that he played with <coughs> I mean, in, in the covenant promises that God had made. And Joshua teaches more about how God keeps his covenant promises. So it's a wonderful thing. So let's uh, delve in, have a little bit more look into Joshua itself. So <coughs> a couple of things to be thinking through. <coughs> it's a... It's a uh, it's a pretty busy book in terms of what's going on. But if you think it through in those two parts, I said right here, there's two aspects of it. There's the conquest and then there's the land allotment. Right? Then it sort of breaks up in a little bit uh, more detail. There. So we've got the beginning, the prologue. And like most books, it's got a great set of bookings, prologue and the epilogue. But then they enter into the land. What's happening there, how they start coming across into that Canaan area. Then they start conquering the land. <coughs> so all that part is building up the concrete. And you probably remember some of those stories, and we'll look at those briefly as we go through about them conquering the land. Then they receive, once they're in their promised land, they start receiving their promised land. That's where it starts being broken up into the various allotments for each of the 12 tribes. Then there's a very short, uh, important summary, and it jumps in into the epilogue. But again, if you just think through those two aspects, conquering, allotment, probably an easy way to remember the story line coming through the book of Joshua. Two words, probably summarize it. Now there's a bunch of main themes that come through there. And the important thing about this is how it fits into the Bible. Now, one of the things I like about these subjects, they all link so well with some of the previous subjects. So, of course, you remember that promise to fulfill that subject. Maybe, John, you don't, because unless you've done it elsewhere. Uh, not in not in this. Okay. It's, it, it's actually a good subject to do, but uh, we did that one about this time last year, uh, promise to fulfillment, where it's, that shows all of the things and how it fits into context. And even Ken mentioned a day in the sermon, and Dave uh, made some points there about things about context, how it fits into what's the biblical context. It's important to note that as we're thinking through Joshua. There's a couple of main things. One is God's promises. And we know the promises that God gave Abraham back in earlier Genesis in terms of to his descendants the people of Israel, that this would be your land. Remember, you had a chance to see it as far as you could to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, blah, blah. This is what would be the land of promise. And, one of the, and as I said, with these themes, God is ever faithful to his promises. And that subject, promise to fulfillment, actually highlights all those things. We'll see that, that chart. We'll use that next week as a reminder of God's continual faithfulness to his promises. And of course, and of course, there was much to be realised. But the thing is, as they, as they came into the land, even as the very end of Deuteronomy talks about, uh, there's blessings for obedience, there's problems, curses for disobedience. And that passage that uh, you read for us, Lewis, in terms of just reminding us what was said in terms of, whoops, they had, yeah, just like us, they had sinned. So there's a couple of key themes. So we want to talk through uh, those as we go through the rest of today. But uh, don't hear about all me from all of today. So we're going to get you to a, bit, a, little, a little bit of work. One of the characters, and, and I've, I guess I've grown to love him as a character of the Bible even more so since we've been doing some of this study. And that happened last year 
and also as a reminder of what comes through in Judges. And of course, who can guess who that person is? It's a name that comes up in here a few times. Rattle off the judges that we know. No, no, not necessarily. <laughs> Caleb. Mm. Why Caleb? Well, you're gonna you're gonna find out too. Hey, no, no, Caleb was with Joshua. He's a spy. So I'm I'm not going I'm not going to I'm not gonna tell you, you're gonna work that out because I'm gonna get you guys to uh, just in your little groups on your table. There's a couple of questions. Just for a few minutes, want to work out, well, who is he? So you've got your Bible, you've got your, you've got your uh, devices as well. You can always do a check there and if you can't find out where first he comes in. First mentioned a creek in the Bible. Stood up to the 11 on the Yes. So, so there's a couple of questions I want you to answer. Who's Caleb? What's the characteristics of his faithfulness? What, what do we sense coming through there? And what attributes of Caleb are applicable for us as Christians today? So Tony and... Uh... Yep, is that okay? Yep. yep. Uh, <laughs> All right, we're coming back now. So I've got a good opportunity to... Yep. Okay, so let's, let's, let's have a look at it. So talking about Joshua, and in the book of Joshua, of course, we hear Caleb mentioned a few times, but also we hear Caleb mentioned where else? Numbers. 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 What about? Well, what was he doing? He went with Joshua as a spy into the land of Canaan, and came back with a report. Mm -hmm. Joshua, the only one to return to the good report. Well, he showed courage compared to the other scholars who didn't want to get a call. And he showed, uh, gave us all the lesson on how to live as Christians. Okay. All right. Because, so, uh, so, that's Ram, Ram. Right, let's just, sorry, before, don't the, jump in here, Dan John. I know, he is. All right, so let's talk about faith. Thanks, thanks Tom. Characteristics of his faithfulness. What did you guys come up with? Well, he was faithful. I mean, he was a gave a monster report. So he, he waited 45 years until the, the land was actually allotted to his family or his group. But so he, but he was faithful all the time. Hey. Good point. Thanks for raising that one. Yep, yep. Um, and still just as active. I heard Don's, you know, well, Don and uh, Dave were talking about. Yeah. I'm not 45 anymore, but imagine if I had to wait another 45 years to do something, would I still be as active? I don't think so. I would have. <laughs> what else? What about his faithfulness? What else do we know about his faithfulness? It seems to be in a lot of places. It was wholehearted. Mm. That's a refrain. Yep. Okay. There's another aspect too. I just wonder if you picked up about, if you saw that one, about his daughters. Did you did you pick up that references in there about his daughters? No. no. Just the way that they acted. Now, in terms of they knew the promises being made. Where is, what is that? Well, that's, that's still in Joshua there too. Yeah. I'll just cover it off first and you come back and look at it. But in terms of thinking through the, these daughters, the way they acted, there's a sense that the way that they had been brought up, that's the point I'm making here. So you see that influence of Caleb is not just for himself, but there is the flowing over with his offspring too, the way that they um, acted in terms of understanding God's promises and what was right. What are the attributes that might be applicable for us? You mentioned one there, Glennis, a minute ago. What was that? Can you say it again? What do we hear about uh, Caleb all the time? What is it my attribute? Wholehearted. What does that mean? Being wholehearted. No, uh, no, 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 no. No. Believing and trusting every aspect of your being. Mm. I think that's the sense whole coming through. It's yeah. a bit like you know, you know, you know those corporate training things that you have and you've got to you got to fall back and have someone will catch up. Trust, you know, you trust in that. So God's got it. Even when you get doesn't see one, he's got it. 
God is going to bring justice. Yeah. Even if you can't see it. What I think is wholehearted there. Wholehearted is actually doing that. Yeah. Not just hearing about it or we talk about it, but actually it is that fact of doing that. Well, then, like, I heard something the other day about faith and how, because I actually went, went a few weeks ago, I went to a, a, a circus, was at the Penrith, and then trapeze artists. Now, there's a point where you face about first of all, you were a do, the part you do is you swing. But then there's a point where when you let go and you tumble in the air to grab the next one, that's the faith part because something could happen, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's right. And that's the part. That's right. The trapeze artists are really good. Even more so, was there a net underneath? It wasn't underneath, but you need to use your net. Net's, yeah, it's God. Well, no, God is more than the net. He is, right? He's That's driving. right. He's actually driving it. It's actually him. That's right. But thanks for reminding us, though, in terms of wholeheartedness. Yeah. Anything else about Caleb? Well, he's obviously a Jew, and he's come out of uh, Egypt, so he's actually come with all the uh, experience of... Uh, you know, the wandering in the wilderness, and uh, and so he's come out of slavery in Egypt. He's come into the wilderness where everyone had basically lost except two people before getting into the promised land. So he's seen the promises of God being fulfilled countless times yeah. along the way. And I guess that, you know, blessing and curse sort of sits pretty strongly in his mind. And he wasn't yeah. discouraged when he's 45 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. And he didn't forget. No. He didn't forget the promise of God. No. And the other, it, it's another one that you might, might have thought about. He was actually a leader with his tribe. He's one of the heads of family. Yeah. So I think he took that role seriously as well. So there's a lot of aspects about Caleb, which I think, you know, as I heard you mention it a while ago, Don. One of the heroes of the Bible for you, is that right? Well, I think that's the uh, this is more of us because I find a, I find a lot of modern Christianity and naval gazing introspective. Mm. And here is a guy that went into danger mm. purely following uh, his faith in God. Yep. And it was a it was a risky deal. And we should remember that because we spend so much time, you know, um, I think. Well, we, we, we just got to learn that lesson. We've got to go out into the unknown. And the <coughs> <coughs> Again, we live in a plural society, and not everyone's going to agree with us, and they've got every right not to agree with us. And we're just going to go out there and be part of that society. Yep. And I think Caleb's a great inspiration going out into the unknown. Perhaps, it's a yeah. very, very great. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps one of the applications for that might be taking the opportunity to go with a church plant. Mm. Yeah, it's quite possible. Because it's that catch cry of be strong and courageous. And it's that saying there's no barrier, that's an impediment to God. So, and on that simple level, just standing up to the other people that went in there, no, the other, the other 10 spies. Mm. It's always hard to stand up against a group. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, that's just a couple of little things. Just another, just as another throw in there for for Caleb, the land where he went to actually took over those cities. Mm. Remember when they went in the spies and saying, "Oh, they're as big as giants," you know, the Amalekites and all that sort of stuff. Blah blah blah. Maybe they're ex basketball players. I don't know, but they're all big. Well, the area that Caleb actually went and took over was that the land on which he Yeah, which, but in that little area, they were known as the. Yeah, so he trusted he trusted God's promises. Yep. Ah, uh, yeah. That's why that's why I love studying about and I think there's a lot of these little people, a lot of these people in the Bible mm. who, wow, what great examples of faith. Well, also in that story with Cat and got right now. Yes. Yeah. And we'll talk about her in a few moments. Oh. Good, oh, good segue. Is that to hurry me up? Thanks, Don. Okay. <laughs> All right. But it's good to just to digress a little bit and sort of think through there's more to this Joshua study than just conquest and whatever. Here we actually see, and I, for me, I think it's one of the bigger takeouts is someone like Caleb, who's a real person. It's almost like watching Judge Judy, you know, real people, real, you know, real circumstances, all that sort of stuff. He's a real person doing real stuff. 
but he did it faithfully. And, and God blessed him. Now, I'm not saying we're doing it because of God's blessings. We know we have that ultimate blessing in Christ. But what an example of being faithful. All right. Now, remember I mentioned in that uh, the, the study in terms of the promise to fulfillment. That's all about thinking about how things fit the context. Remember those sort of things? So you've got your historical context or your biblical context. Well, we're going to think about how does Joshua itself fit into the Bible? So the first part, there's a couple of different ways that we can slice and dice this one. Um, but the one is in terms of how it sort of fits in the relationship between the Genesis to Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Tony, would you like to read can you do that passage for us, please? Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. <clears throat> Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond, beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates, and I led him throughout Canaan, and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I, I, I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I, I afflicted the Egyptians for what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the kind the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse, put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam, so he uh, blessed you again and again, and delivered you out of his hand. Okay, so there's a little bit of a summary of what's actually transpired from Genesis through to uh, them coming into the promised land. So just thought it's a good way to summarize it. There's also one of the couple of the Psalms is a good way of summarizing some of the Old Testament bits as well. But what, what this is saying in terms of what I'm hearing in Joshua is linking the promises that God made to the patriarchs. About his faithfulness in sorry. I'm sorry, it's all it's all God's doing as well. It's That's right. Exactly, exactly all is God's doing. A reminder for all of us. Our salvation is all of God's doing. So faithfulness in giving the land, and even so, despite their rebellion in the wilderness. And as, uh, as you said, Andrew, there was just the fact that two of them, both Joshua and Caleb, were the only two, other than probably little babies or something, that actually got through from that bunch of people that came out of Egypt. Mm, all the incredible, incredible. Yeah, so it's important to remember that. Yes, despite the judgment, despite their unfaithfulness, God was still faithful. Then we look at another, another way to uh, build the context for this is how it fits in all of Israel's history. And the important thing is, in the passages in the Pentateuch, it's all about God's promises to the land, the people, right, all that sort of stuff. Then Joshua then starts off, right, they're now physically at the land. Then they're moving into the land and having the allotment. So we start seeing that not only we're just talking promises now, we're starting to see some of those physical delivery of those promises. That's an important aspect we need to be aware of. And as, as you know, the land was such a big deal for the people of Israel. So important. That connection is so, so strong. 
And it's interesting, though, it's always been God's land. Everything is his. The stars. The psalmist reminds us of that. What it does, though, it helps picture us with, okay, they're now moving into the land, and Joshua sets that whole theme up. We know, and we see coming through the judges, and I mentioned earlier on, we really only see the fulfilment of having control over the land in the time of David. Then what happens not long after that? But doing all those things, and then they get pushed off. The northern kingdoms go off to exile. A number of years later, they enjoy the southern kingdom goes off into exile as well. Wow. Now, their demise is not because of a lack of God's faithfulness and power. We see that time and again that God still delivers his faithful remnant. In one way, I picture Caleb and Joshua as the faithful remnant from that first bunch of people that came out of Egypt. And there was a lot of people. It does sort of bring the question, which I ask, is at what stage did the land become a, an island? I mean, I know it's a place of rest, but in that trail of Israel's woe, and God telling them, look, it's about me. The land is certainly your place of rest. But well, I think I think Hebrews actually answers that question pretty well. So it talks about what is that rest? Even the people in the Old Testament were always looking for that other rest, that eternal rest. And I think that's the answer to the question. Um, as soon as we start putting anything before God, we have created that on. So as soon as you start putting the land is the most important thing, they've created that on. You know, the land was a God-given instrument for them to live as part of his promise. But as I said, those patriarchs always had that view of what was better. So should we. Particularly, like around the fall of the southern kingdom, in the time of Jeremiah, you know, the people comforting themselves, saying, "No, no, no, this is God's land. This is the land that God gave us, so nothing can take us away, take it away from us. It's ours forever." Um, and not actually paying any attention to the God who gave them the land. So their security was in the fact that they had the land, not that they had the God that they gave. Them. <laughs> that slight variation, that slight deviation from God's intent in time leads to a chasm. Mm -hmm. Isn't it the same with us even today? Yeah, we have various other Christian thinkings coming yeah. in, prosperity gospel, or stuff yeah. like that. Well, hold on. That's, yeah. I mean, I, I'm in a contemporary context, I probably think. Some of the Christian radio stations, and I think about you know, life insurance, but they get a lot of life insurance has a role, but it doesn't provide the security in the sense of where we're going. No. I wish they would advertise life assurance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, it's, it's all those sorts of And given today's sermons, so we'd be here at uh, in Corinthians, imagine. You know, all those advertising of you know, Christian single reading online or something. Yeah. Like that. Christian singles reading scripture. <laughs> but anyway, um, here we go. There's another aspect you want to think about is how this fits into the New Testament. Now, even, even Joshua points in some way as a successor to Moses. As we see that, in terms of the very end of Deuteronomy, coming into um, uh, his death in Numbers, but as we see that earlier on, but in terms of Deuteronomy, 
being the baton being passed over then to Joshua. So there is that successor coming through. And that was anticipated knowing with Joshua, with Moses coming death. But so Joshua's ministry really much more, as we think about it, an extension of Moses' ministry. But all of those were pointing to something far greater. And you may remember in one of the earlier sections here of Deuteronomy, it actually talks about the prophet. The prophet. And that's pointing, of course, to Jesus. And even Joshua himself, by name, is a pointer to Jesus. I don't think that's coincidental somehow. <laughs> um, he's not Jesus, but I think he is pointing to Jesus. And really pointing beyond Cain as that promise rests, awaits for all of us. Hey, Luke, do you want to read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8, 9 from Chris? <clears throat> Hebrews 4, 8, 9. For if Joshua had given the rest, God would not have spoken away another day. There remained then a separate rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest, God's rest from the man, but Joshua's God from this. So it's all pointing, in fact, to that other days, that other rest. And you raised that issue about rest a while ago, Lewis, in terms of thinking through what is God's rest. But it is that ultimate rest which we await. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come back soon. Come back soon. So there's a couple of things, as, we, as we've learned about before, when we're looking at the Bible, we need to get a sense of what's the historical context but also the biblical context. So remember those couple of things we've just gone through, how it fits with the Pentateuch, the history of Israel, and then as it fits into the New Testament. <coughs> I know when we were doing uh, Joshua last year and then Judges earlier this year, some of that context we may have forgotten about, a little bit about that. So it's always handy to come back and remember those things. It helps us to see that. And I know with some of the Judges, we did look at very much how does this fit into God's big picture narrative. But that's not for today. Right, so that's in the New Testament. The other things which we can find through is there's a number of sub-themes that uh, get mentioned a fair bit within Joshua. Now, the first one, of course, is about leadership. I've already just briefly touched on that as we think about who... Moses handed over to Joshua, and Joshua takes over the leadership of that. But just make a point there hmm. that Moses trained Joshua to take over. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't just around. Yeah, that was right. He was his apprentice. So who went up on Mount Sinai? Who went up when God was giving out the tablets? Oh, don't mean it. Yeah, it actually, say states that Moses went up with his servant. Joshua. Yeah. So, so did he come down looking like Moses did? You know, this dwelling. Instead of the sun. I think a little bit more distance. I had, he had that social distance. He, he was COVID safe. <laughs> but in terms of, yeah, so you're right. Yeah, Joshua was. But Joshua didn't train someone to take a No. No, but I think it was the way that God had set that up. And I know. When I was a younger person, in terms of the game of leadership, so I was always talked about training successes. Mm. You sort of wonder, you wonder. Well, Joshua seemed to complete the ridding of the land so they would have peace and they would not need it. Mm. But does that also highlight a shift in how the leadership of Israel was transitioning? Um, I think, I think we'll find that as we 
as we progress through this particular course, we'll see that whole shift in terms of leadership. I mean, do I spoil the fun for the next few weeks, but I think you will start noticing that happening. So, spoiler, no, I do spoil it. Sorry, you can not keep it. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I would never want to spoil that. <laughs> the other thing is, the way that Joshua is portrayed in this particular passage is he is shown, as I mentioned before, as quite a great military strategist, the way he did things. Now, you've got to really put it back to who was actually his real coach, who was actually his lead. It was God. And so many times when things were happening, they went to the Lord and the Lord provided the information what they needed to know about what to do. Well, right at the very beginning, right at the very beginning, coming into the land, yes. So we see that leadership, that transition out of Moses, then into Joshua. And then we'll start seeing over the next few weeks as we go through the next bunch of studies, what happens with leadership beyond that. But there are so many strong parallels between Moses' ministry and, of course, Joshua. I mean, one of the classics happens right at the beginning of Joshua. God promises to be with Joshua just as he was with Moses. Didn't hear that about, spoiler alert, any of the judges. Be with you as I was with Joshua or whatever. Mm. So interesting shift. We'll probably see that coming through. Um, in terms of Moses had a particular personal encounter with God, didn't he? Which one was that? Which ones? With the burning bush. Well, the non we only got burning bush because it didn't burn with the non burning burning bush. The fire in the bush. Well, the fire in the bush, but it wasn't consuming it, yes. What was Moses's one? Sorry, what was Joshua's one? Encounter with the Lord. That angel, right, as they came into the land. Well, one of the issues too that uh, Moses did receive from God the rules and instructions, but then uh, Joshua didn't get a new rules after that. This is just saying this is what God's already told Moses. So. And what did he say right at the beginning? Do not let it depart from you. Study it day and night. That's a challenge for each of us too. Mm. There's a bunch of those parallels between Moses and Joshua. And the notes give some pretty good information about that. I won't go through all of them today. So really in one way, Joshua is quite an extension of the mosaic type of leader that God had for that period of time. I think that's an important point to, uh, to be made. Um, and I think for I think we've looked at some of the characteristics of uh, Caleb. I think characteristics for Joshua for each of us is okay. He was the leader of the people of Israel for that period of time. Well, each of us, wherever we we're a leader at home, might be a leader in you know Sunday school or Bible study or whatever. But it is the courageous, being courageous, but the wholehearted devotion to God. I think that's a lesson for each one of us. So maybe if you take away nothing from today except that, and it drives you to be more wholeheartedly devoted to God, then I am really thankful for that. There's another sub theme which is important, which is the sub theme which is talked about all the way through the Pentateuch, so right from the very beginning about, oops, those arrows have moved in the transition <laughs> to scaling, um, but it's, those arrows are meant to point from obedience through the blessing and disobedience through the curse. We find that very much in Scripture, right from the very beginning. Okay, give me an example, not Joshua and Moses, someone in the first parts of the early parts of the Bible. Blessing, oh, sorry, obedience led to blessing. Abraham. Okay, there's one. Give us another one. Joseph. Joseph. 
Joseph, okay, yep, yep. Or yep. Mary. Sorry? Mary, that's how No, we're talking about the first couple of books there. I mean, the first couple of books of the New Testament. <laughs> What's something you want, Tony? <laughs> how about Enoch? Where is he? He's with the Lord. That's right. Yeah. Noah. There's a, there's a bunch of them. And then we've got disobedience leads to cursing. Give me some examples. Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel, yep. Yeah. I can, can yep. Yeah. Who else? Any others? Thank you. <laughs> very, very much. Straight away. And, you, and I think it's, I find it so interesting to think about. There's the first family, I was thinking, in terms of established, Adam and Eve, first two boys. You'd think, you know, in our sort of thing, you'd think it would take quite a while before things would degrade to the point that a brother would kill a brother. But I think it just shows the impact of sinfulness. And I think God's word is tremendous like that. It shows the reality of sin. That's the first two boys, Adam and Eve's two boys, one of them kills the other. There is murder. Now, you might have thought, oh, maybe they start lying, telling, you know, fibs or playing or doing all that sort of stuff, speeding on their camels when they shouldn't have, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But here, straight away, to just shows the power of sin. Mm. Don't ever be deceived. Sin is there. And the heart of man is ever so. So when we're thinking about the law, it's not a sense of that legalistic rigidity we're looking at. God looks at what's in here. And he actually says elsewhere in scripture, he looks at what's in here. We can fool ourselves, we can fool others. We can never fool God. Important thing to remember that. God sees reality. There's also another important sub thing, and that's about the land. Now, we've talked a bit about that before, but we'll continue on it. And when we're thinking through the land, what the focus in Joshua is not about the military aspect nor the geographical for that matter. It's more about the focus between God and his people. God promised them this land, land of milk and you know, overflowing with milk and honey. I love a place with that, lots of honey. As you know me, I do like my honey. But you sort of think through, yeah, the focus when they're talking about the land is actually the relationship with God. It's just another component of God's working his promises through for his people. And their conquest moving through was not about their own individual achievement. Give me an example of where that was shown so obviously. John? Can you think of one? <clears throat> What's the question? In terms of, give me an example of where it's an obvious the conquest was not their achievement, but God's doing it. Jericho. Jericho. Mm -hmm. Remember that song? Those of you who grew up as in the youth group or something? Joshua so fought the battle of Jericho. Remember that one? Yeah. Certainly remember that song. Yeah. The land is also like sometimes we lose sight of how important the land is to the rest of the Bible. Um, like the, the language that God uses around the land and the, the way the Bible writes, you know whole of the Old Testament speaks of the kingdom of God um, and the land, all of that gets, particularly the, the latter prophets always gets transformed into thinking about and shaping our thoughts about the, the universal kingdom of God or the, you know, the New Testament concept of the kingdom of God. And we, we transfer that language over, but we take, like we modify it, what it's meaning, I mean, physical land and borders, but it carries, as it transfers over, it carries with it the same sense of belonging to God's kingdom, 
mm. of the permanence of the promise. That's, so that's the key. This is shaping what will be an important part of the New Testament as well. Mm. Because you're talking about a whole lot of misfits. They're not, you know, when you leave from Abraham onwards, you know, they don't have this connection with somewhere. They're still trying to find it until mm. God then leads them to where it is. Yep. Yep. And the other thing which we, we need to remember, of course, that this land was God's gift. <coughs> <coughs> it wasn't theirs by right. Now, I'm sure there'd be some people who would struggle to hear that, particularly if they were from the older style thinking of Israel. But it actually was a gift. It was probably not the land itself that was the gift, it was the living in the land that was the gift. Well, there was a promise made to Abraham, this will be your land. So, yeah, so it's that sense of kif, but also it came with, then you know, if you're going to be there, then you're going to have to live in it and do something with it, make it worthwhile. But also, more importantly, it actually came with the obligations. The obligations about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, etc. Et <coughs> I think that's what it really means to live in any land for God. Is with those obligations. Um, John, can you read for me, please? Joshua chapter 1, verses 69. Please. One, six, Be strong, be resolute. It is you who are put. It is, it is you who are to put this people in possession of the land, which I swore to their forefathers I would give them. Only be very strong and resolute. Observe diligently all the law which my servant Moses gave you. If you would succeed wherever you go, you must not swerve from it either to right or to left. This book of the law must never be off your lips. You must keep it in mind day and night so that you may diligently observe everything that is written in it. Then you will prosper and be successful in everything you do. Where are we in? No, no. No. This is my command be strong, be resolute, do not be fearful or discouraged, for wherever you go, the Lord your God is with you. So there was there were obligations for the people. And it's important to note, of course, that the, the promise of that land was not irrevocable. I think that's where they got stuck on, particularly when you start hearing about state mentioned before. In terms of when the northern tribe will take off, the southern tribe think, well, it's not going to happen to us. Well, yeah. But they were there to observe the terms of what that Sinai covenant, which is the whole law of God, was all about. And the blessings would continue to then flow through. Continue to do what it is. So I just want to show in terms of a couple of maps and uh, we'll get you a harder copy of this so you can keep because it's a good thing to have reference to. But you can see, of course, uh, remember we talked about Caleb before? Just wanted to show that. That was where he went through. That's the way that they travel up and down, collecting their uh, samples of things. Remember they did, did that, brought back some stuff and whatnot. But, but more importantly, I want to show here where the other nations were that they mm -hmm. were. And you start seeing references to coming up. Eden, reference to Eden comes from who moved to Eden? Remember that? Esau. Esau. The Amorites, remember that's where those kings, King Og, and all those guys, they all got, uh, they were done. Then they're moving in to the promised land. There's Jericho, you see it there. Um, so it's just handy to. So we get a copy of this, so you've got, it also mentions a couple of those towns or cities, so that when we're knowing about battles or whatever, you can, oh yeah, that's what it is, whatever. So it's just handy to go back from that. And of course, just a quick overview, this is how the land then was divided up. So we don't want to jump too far, but that's towards the end of Joshua. So remember we talked about the conquest of the land, and really don't want to go through you know, the individual stories of, you know, of Jericho, AI, and those sort of things. I just think it's important to note 
the principle coming through. Now, the principle we had before in terms of trusting in God. Jericho was a great example. That wasn't their battle at all. All they had to do was be obedient to march around and do what God had said. So how long was it since then to them when they broke out to one and seven? Several hundred years or hundred years? Uh, well, you find, you find the separation after David, so David, then Solomon. So it was actually with Solomon that you were Jeroboam and then the northern kingdom with Rehoboam. So yeah, you are looking quite a few, a couple hundred years. So that's how the land splits. You might just notice very briefly, Dan is down in the middle bit here near Ephraim, so that's like the central patch, the southern and then the northern. They didn't quite do what they needed to do in terms of that towards the latter stage of their allotments. Uh, the Philistines started to get into a stronger uh, sort of a military approach and the Dan's couldn't quite get in there, so they thought too hard. So they packed up and went north. And so they you know, taking a little bit of land, just on the little bit of Nathalie, but just on the flip side there, well above the top part of the allotments. So they had a fairly big piece and then they went to a tiny little bit. Hmm, interesting. So just handy to know in terms of how that land was uh, split. And you see the tribes, the other tribes that stayed on. This side, Reuben and Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, and the other half tribe of Manasseh was there. Isn't it interesting how Syria was in the middle of Judah? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And when you actually read through some of the things, you'll find out how they worked that out. When I, from, from someone who's not Jewish and will never try to work out what's the significance of the placements, um, that's probably a study in itself. But uh, they chosen by Lot? No, he had died by then. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they had, they had picked where they were going by working out those sort of things. But in terms of why did Simi get that swimming pool as part of Judah? Maybe because it was a nice swimming pool part of Judah. I don't know. Because a lot of this was all quite barren. I mean, yeah. So, so did Simeon stay there as a plot of land? Because there's a clear division later in the uh, northern and southern kingdom that you've got the 10 tribes north and only yeah. Benjamin, Judah, south. Peter and Judah then joined really as the one. Yeah. So, yeah. Simeonites. Yeah. Now, that's this really going to. Test your memory, of course. Test your memory with as we go into judges. So we might park that, but I think that's important to think about. Oh, where were some of those things? Did they do the things that they needed to do? So this was the allotment. Doesn't mean that, as I said, I've shown down at the top that Dan never really was there. That Dan's allotment was down on the uh, on the coast. Why would we want to stay on the coast? Anyway. I just really want to cover off one other very important uh, uh, aspect. And it came up a lot when we were studying uh, Joshua last year. It also came up very much when we were doing about the judges, God's justice and the defeat, the killing of so many Canaanite people. What's going on? There? So... There's a little bit in the notes about that, uh, probably more than uh, uh, you may remember from your sermons, but I encourage you if you want to go back and have a look at some of the sermons. But the key thing to remember is God's judgment on the people who live in land, those the kings. You may remember back in those days that they had waited the 400, God had waited 400 years because their evil had not come to the full fruition of what God had for punishment. The key thing that I think is to take out from this one is that there is no religion, they had other, you know, those, those other places, and all these other false religions, there's no religion protection against God. No religion against protection against God. God's judgment, <clears throat> he is king, he is rule, he knows. I think what it's saying here is, it just reminds us in Joshua, 
that there is the reality in God's judgment. So a couple of verses to uh, have a look at. Uh, I think everyone's had a chance to read, have they? I think we all have been. Yeah. Lewis, do you want to get the uh, Hebrews passage? And uh, Tony, can you get the two Thessalonians, please? Uh, that's 7B, not 76. Yeah. Just between you. Yeah, 7B, so the seven, second part, verse 7 there. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, 7B to 9. Okay. Lewis, do you want to do the uh, Hebrews for us, please? Hebrews 10, verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice of sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy, testimony of God, two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished? Who has trampled the son of God underfoot? Who has treated as an as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him? And who has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, "It is mine to avenge; I will repay." And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall at the hands of the living God. Yep. Thank you. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out in the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. God has tremendous forbearance against with people. Look what's happened here with those. People in those uh, came out 400 years. They kept sinning and getting more into sin. So God still acted. When he did act with punishment, it happened, happened quite finally for many of them. But that serves as a warning for us. God's final judgment is due to come. It is due to come. And those two passages, I think, just to help remind us that it will be cataclysmic for those who do not love Jesus, who have not made him their Lord and Saviour. And I'm not trying to say that as part of being a sort of fan club or whatever. No, no, no. It's all about God's grace. And this, there's a reality to this God's grace that's not absent from Joshua. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, you, yeah. you say it. Yeah. I mean, classic example. Think, just give me an example, because we didn't go through all the various battles. Whatever. Can you give me an example where God's grace was totally, totally full? You would never have thought of it. Give me an example of one. Uh, Thank you. There is a classic example. God's grace. Now, you'd think just the way that's described for her, she would have deserved that same punishment of all as all the people in Jericho. But God, in his grace, so, and to the point now, we even see her name listed in the genealogy of Christ. Not the only one that goes into that category. Can you think of another person? Yes. yes. So there's people outside of God's people who have been saved. There's a similar thing with, um, like the similar thing if you look at the Gibeonites as well. Uh, yeah, they didn't join the coalition to come against Israel. Because, and this is where it correlates with uh, Rahab too, because they saw what the Lord had done. So they had some sort of revelation for them, and they decided not to go against that God, but rather to, uh, you know, Rahab openly and faithfully, maybe you not know, true deception, but either way, to actually try and get on the right side of that God, um, uh, which, you know, which is, I, I guess, a little bit instructive to how to approach the Lord humbly, seeking his presence and protection rather than approaching head on with rebellion. Yeah. There's also a difference between the way Rahab was treated afterwards and the way the Gibeonites were treated afterwards. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. They both kept their heads. Yes. <laughs> but, but interestingly, with the uh, Gibeonites, and 
it went through the study, you might read a little bit of as you're reading through Joshua itself. Uh, yeah, all the uh, you know, feigning of all the stuff that they did to, to get that to happen. But the flip side of that story is, here's Joshua, and the elders, they didn't, they just took it on face value. They didn't actually inquire of the Lord what to do. And uh, interesting, you know, straight after, not long after, what happened at A, with AI, with Achan and whatever, then the Gibeonites did rule. Anyway, I think we'll learn from that. The other one to think through in terms of God's grace, you read through that in with the allotments. If I go back to the maps, probably this one. You may remember the cities of refuge. They were, you know, various places. So it was reasonably equally distant for people to travel to. What's the idea behind the city of refuge? In case there's a stuff up that occurs and uh, someone can retreat to there and protect yeah. it. Someone who inadvertently, accidentally, causes the death of someone else. Right. That sort of thing. Now, that is, a, that is an element of God's grace being applied to these people saying, accidents can happen. You know, a rock can fall down from a cliff because someone's working nearby and it falls down and kills them. Well, not on purpose, it just happened. Yeah, so that's another example of God's grace, which didn't happen in that part of the world. If, if that was you doing the rock and caused it to fall to other cultures, you and probably your family would be dead. Payback. More, yeah, payback with greater interest. Yeah, well, yeah that's why the, they, the Jews have to keep the night by night. To, to limit mm. damage, not to. Yes, not to, not to give it a free reign. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, why, why is that an example of grace rather than justice? I mean, it seems to me that what that kind of example suggests is that God's justice has grace built into it. Of course it is. The foundation of God's justice is his grace. Right, but what I'm getting overall from this is I, I'm hearing plenty of reasons to fear God, but I'm not hearing, other than isolated examples, I'm not hearing a picture of God who loves. It's mm. yeah. but, isn't um, that, but isn't that part of it? the challenge is that he's actually bringing in a new system, a new order into a land that we're not used to that? So that's where the grace aspect is coming in because he's actually inserting that component into the lifestyle of this new nation that is in the promised land. Mm -hmm. Like Exodus 19, when he's getting at Israel the law, um, he acknowledges that the whole earth is mine, but for you, you will be my kingdom of priests, the, you know, a holy nation. And their role as a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, it's not just to have the land, to sit back and enjoy it, kick out all the, the rubbish people, but to be actually priests to the world, a light to the Gentiles, to the nations around them. So they had a mediating role as part of God's overall plan for his people. Um, and through Abraham, those original promises and promises, God, and promises. through him, and through that family, the people that the families have come from, they will be a blessing to the whole world. So God's justice in dealing with sin is also making way for his plan to bring blessing to all of his creation. Mm -hmm. Because the culmination is effectively Solomon and how the nations come because they are in all of who he is. Or God is actually. And I think for Solomon, that's Old Testament three subject. <laughs> Not this subject. We finish before Solomon. But, uh, but it is a good question though. And, and I know those sort of themes come through particularly when we're studying judges, because you start getting down into individual little incidents going on. Hold on, how is God, why is God worried? You? How, all those sort of questions come to mind. I think it's stepping back and seeing, this is the narrative of what happens when people have to disobey God. And from Genesis, right the beginning of Genesis, we're seeing, seeing the way that sin plays. But this undercurrent, and it's always there of God keeping his promises and building his kingdom up the way that he had originally planned.
It'd be worthwhile, um, John, if you do get a chance, go back and actually do that other subject, promised and fulfillment. So I think that actually answers your question better than just looking at, say, Joshua and Judges and whatever, because that takes the big picture off. But if you hang on to that thought, next week I'll have that chart for you. So you can come back to it and say, I can see a little bit more about what God's purpose is towards ultimate kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that help? Probably not. It might. It might. We'll see. <laughs> the probably thing that's not going to help you the most, though, right now is reminder of homework for next week. You can get to talk about right now. Well, I was conscious of uh, the smoke going <laughs> in this mate, so. <laughs> that might not but what you can do, though, <coughs> as you're thinking through Rahab, have a look through the notes, read through, if you haven't already through Judges, uh, Joshua, have a read through Joshua. But for next week, at least have a scan read through Judges. We're not going to be going through each of the, the 12 Judges. <coughs> we don't have time for that, but I think what we'll see is a picture of how Hmm. God is still faithful, yet shows God's faithful despite people's unfaithfulness. And just wanted to think through, would you reflect about what may be new or challenging? So the very point that you were making there, just think through that. What I want you to think about is how do you move from what we've learned today and as you read through the notes, have a read again, if you haven't already read through Joshua in one hit, read through Joshua. Have a read through that as well. But think through how do you move forward with that? I mean, it, is, it is a good question. I see all these things happening, but I don't see God's place. Where, where, how do I correlate the two? How do I, is there a convergence? Where, where do I see that? If you want to talk more about it, um, you've got my email address. We can chat during the week. I'm sure Dave's available too. But yeah, just have a think through those. You can reflect on it. Because I think what, what we're trying to do with these courses, it's not about here. We've said that one before. These courses are not about here, so you can pass an exam. That's right. It's all about the ticker. And then the pass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all about here. I mean, studying the Bible is not for the benefit of a PGC exam. Some of the Bible is to actually get to know the Lord Jesus more, yeah, a lot more effectively and to love him more. It's that song to learn better each day. Uh, is it? Know you more, know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. Can you say that? Right. Day by day, I can. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it's in the end, in the end, written by Paul in Thessalonians. Yeah. You don't want to get to the end of the journey and say, God say, I never knew. Yeah. Away from me, you will do. Yeah. 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 All right. So thank you everyone for uh, coming on today. Um, that was worthwhile. As, as we said, Dave will then um, press the end this. Let's stop recording, is it? Yeah. Okay. So thanks all for coming. Same time next week. Um, don't forget the homework though. Because